Good morning. Um, I'm here uh, from Intel. Uh, for many of my friends here in the audience, uh, I used to be not long ago at HR Labs. Um, so uh, the, the, the uh, big exciting thing about this whole uh, field for, for Intel is that uh, it seems to be um, coming to a point where there is uh, potential value proposition op I mean, uh, options that are emerging over maybe the next few uh, years. And uh, so what I'm going to talk about, I'm just new to Intel. I joined in January of uh, this year. Uh, so my, my talk is going to be more about a, a, a landscape talk in terms of what machine learning was, what is it today, and what we think it could be in the future, and how Intel may play a role in, uh, in some of these technologies going forward. So with that introduction, so please bear with me in terms of some of the things I'm going to say. You must have heard of it and maybe even sick of it by now. But the first generation machine learning, uh, that is the past, was uh, what we call a shallow supervised learning algorithms. And so notwithstanding uh, you know, Hopfield and other ideas, like we saw this cartoon so many times over this, in this conference, uh, you, know, you have this feed forward model. Uh, there is uh, sort of biological analogs for various elements of the, of the network. For example, synapses would be those weights. Dendrites would be those arrows getting into those transfer function blocks. Then there's a dendritic trunk which then uh, so feeds that information to a cell and which then processes that and sends out some information out. Uh, and and you, you put together networks of these neurons to represent a net, uh, you know, so-called an artificial neural network. And conventional machine learning uh, was developed based on this layered architecture where the goal was to abstract away as much detail as possible, keep it as simple as possible, and then see what we can do with this. And fu functionally, what they wanted, uh, for example, Rumel Hart and others who talked about this uh, way back, uh, the idea being is to learn an input to output transform or a mapping, and you would do that in, a, in, a, in the context of where you have a supervisor that provides some sort of ground truth, and you use the so-called feed-forward feed fully connected architecture where information flows from the input units to the output units as shown in this cartoon. And uh, the, the learning algorithm essentially was based on this idea of gradient descent, where you would use the error between the desired output and the actual output. Uh, and based on differentiable uh, functions such as sigmoidal neurons, you would sort of figure out a way to assign credit and blame for the various uh, weights in the, in the, in the network. Um, and uh, early models, uh, the reason why it didn't really uh, get beyond is so basically it was shallow was because of this local minima problem that gets worse with the depth of the network. And so to shallow learners, as, they, as we like to call them, that required handcrafted feature data in order to uh, sort of uh, minimize the number of layers that you want to use in the network. Uh, so we're talking about thousands of parameters. But also, these systems were so susceptible to, if you think of uh, you know, things like irrelevant features in the data. So that's just two slides for the past. Now, the present. So, we're talking deep supervised uh, learning ideas. So the idea being that you have multiple modules with a feed-forward network to compute a nonlinear input-output mapping. And the idea here is that if you can allow many, 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 many layers, many uh, number of neurons to process information, and it's still a feed-forward manner, uh, but then uh, if you can do that, then the, the hope is that you would get increased selectivity and invariance to representation. So, it still abstracts de details away. I mean, we talked, we, we heard uh, Christoph's talk yesterday as to the, the, the level of complexity in the neural system. Uh, assuming it can abstract away all those details, uh, uh, then there were two major approaches uh, that actually drove this field forward uh, from the shallow learners to deep learners. Uh, one of these ideas was this idea of contrastive divergence uh, for feature detection from unlabeled data. So, the, the, the cartoon on the, on the top right there shows uh, this idea is that you have uh, some data that comes in uh, through some neurons called visible inputs, and that gets sort of, uh, let's say, uh, projected onto a, a hidden layer. And then there is this uh, in a process of back and forth between these two to sort of set up a system where the inputs can be predicted by the hidden layer units uh, reliably. And then you do this over and over again through many such pairs of, of modules. To, to sort of set up the system where it's a good order encoder. So it would sort of, uh, each layer would be able to encode its features in the, the layer below it. Um, and so if you, if you put this, uh, this stack together and then you do back propagation on this pre-trained network, so to speak, you would overcome the local minima problems that were a big issue with the, with the shallow learners. 
So that enabled deep learners, and this is uh, the, the restricted Boltzmann machine idea. And then there's also, in parallel, there's another idea, which is sort of, uh, uh, sort of we talked, uh, people talked about it yesterday, uh, this idea of pooling of semantically similar units uh, after doing some convolution or filtering. Uh, you know, originally inspired by Fukushima, the HMAX algorithms, and then uh, Jan Leken as well, who applied back propagation to this idea of you know, layers of convolution and pooling called convolutional nets uh, that allowed us to sort of get over this so-called local minima problem, if you will, in, in uh, the, the, the uh, shallow learners. So the deep learners, uh, they're trainable with large depths, millions of parameters, using raw data. So that is a huge deal. Uh, and that allowed uh, you know, systems that could be automated, sort of fed uh, with uh, real-world data from video streams or from audio streams and so on. And the good thing about this was, because it has all this, uh, the depth in it, the information, uh, like I said earlier, was, uh, was um, able to show increased selectivity to the object details, but not the background. So, um, and the big uh, reason for why deep learning is everywhere today uh, are three factors. Uh, you know, one of them is the, obviously you have fast enough computers enabled by Intel chips, for example, with affordable large memory, um, availability of large data sets for training and benchmarking, obviously. And then, of course, this, this whole uh, bottleneck, uh, overcoming this bottleneck using deep learning technologies such as restricted Boltzmann machine and convolutional nets. So, uh, you know, if you go to uh, any of these conferences, uh, in fact, computer vision conferences are dominated by deep learning methodologies that uh, extract information uh, from videos, uh, does all kinds of stuff, uh, pretty reliably and very impressively. And so that's uh, all good, and so that's where we are today. Uh, deep learning has been explored both from the software and hardware perspective for tackling real world problems. Um, and in the companies, as you all know, including Intel, by the way, is looking into this. Okay, now let's look at uh, what I call this third generation. And, uh, this whole, whole term coined neuromorphic computing was originally by Carver Mead at Caltech in the late 80s to sort of describe analog circuits that mimic neurobiological architectures in the nervous system. So that was basically a coin that was originally developed by Carver, uh, which lately uh, you know, got morphed into this idea called neuromorphic engineering slash computing which was introduced to expand the scope from just not analog circuits, but also include digital mixed mode, analog digital VLSI, and, and also software systems. And so neuromorphic computer, computing today would encompass all these different uh, you know, ideas. And so revisiting this ANNs from what we saw before, uh, this cartoon that we, show, we showed earlier, so look at the, you know, the object, the output function is basically some, some nonlinear function of the, of the inputs. And uh, that's where we were. But the, the reality of it, even if you look at some phenomenological models from neuroscience, uh, time is very implicit in the neuronal dynamics. I mean, you cannot ignore the fact that all these vari various uh, entities in the equations that are modeling, like Hodgkin actually and every other equation that you model, including leak, integrate, and fire, the conductances are functions of, of, of time and voltages. Um, uh, and, and these are uh, implicit in the dynamics. Uh, well, you can wash away those details which, which, which uh, led to astounding success. It's there in the making, and so the question is, what does that uh, add to the value here? Of course, uh, we heard from Christoph and others about um, a whole bunch of features that are, that are prevalent, morphological features, large connectivity, uh, we're talking one to 10,000, laminar structures, you know, layered architectures that seem to repeat itself with recurrent uh, you know, networks where uh, networks of excitatory and inhibitory neurons put together in, in uh, arbitrary configurations to, to realize very complex dynamics. Some of the features that uh, seems to be interesting, at least to Intel, to look at uh, is some of these ideas. So the idea of asynchronous processing with spikes that is both efficient and scaling. So there's lots of evidence for brain being asyn asynchronous. Uh, there's lots of rhythms in the brain, but there's no particular global clock. Uh, so there's evidence for it at all levels, retina through V5, parietal, prefrontal, and other cortices. Uh, and some of the more uh, compelling ones for Intel as, as, as in terms of hardware is the idea that you can encode analog information using a single wire. So uh, you know, the so-called uh, action potentials or spike signals, um, the, the you know, aural laser, who's probably here in this audience somewhere, is, uh, is one of the people who showed that you can actually um, encode reliably 
in the interspike intervals uh, useful information from an analog signal. So what this means is it's going to offer you area efficiency and scalability. That's the first point. And uh, the second point being that uh, these events, so-called address events or events that uh, sort of um, uh, mimic some sort of a salient uh, uh, activity at a neuronal level, uh, dissipates power only during the spike events. So uh, there's energy efficiency, so to speak, from that. Um, and then there's also uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the challenges in transmitting analog information long channels, you know, where you have to transmit both the amplitude and the timing information, can be overcome if you have some, some assuming uh, signal regeneration, you can get reliable transmission of spike signals uh, to longer dis long distances, thereby ensuring reliability when you actually try to put millions of these guys together. Uh, so these are some of the interesting things. But then, then starts the complexity as slowly starts to build up. If you sort of look at it as, as factual evidence as we know today, there's a ver variety of plasticity rules, which is uh, probably key to learning. Uh, one of which is reweighting, which we've all done in the ANNs and the deep learning uh, frameworks which is mostly synaptic in nature. Um, but then there's all these other things, the rewiring, where the, it refers to the processes that create or prune axonal arbors, which are more structural in nature. There's reconnection that refers to processes that form or prune new synapses, which are both structural and synaptic in nature. Uh, there's regeneration that refers to the processes that create or remove neurons, which is structural in nature as well. And last but not the least, seems like there's new discoveries that are talking about reparameterization, uh, re which basically refers to changes in the physical parameters. For example, conduction delays. Uh, there's a beautiful paper by Douglas Fields talking about how the myelination in the, in the axonal arbors can change, uh, causing changes in the conduction delays, adaptation of the delays itself, which is another interesting uh, you know, variation to the whole story we know about. Um, the other important point is that memory and processing, as we know it from our uh, Intel uh, architectures and what we are dealing with here, are very different. So, the, the, so we call it, you know, the Intel, uh, the von Neumann machines are weakly co-located, meaning they are physically and functionally separated. Memory and computing are physically and functionally separated. Uh, and uh, in terms of uh, biology, they seem to be strongly co-located, meaning that they are physically and functionally very tightly coupled. And in particular, neuronal activity uh, seems to enable changes in synaptic efficacy and structure, while synaptic changes in turn also affects the neuronal transmission and uh, interaction. So that's a huge, uh, big difference, uh, first of all. And then synapses seem to multiplex to, to be part of multiple memories. They're distributed in nature. And uh, the memory is accessed by indices that, you know, typically that are not related to memory content in traditional architectures, but in, in, in biology, they seem to be able to recall complete memories from partial cues. Uh, the, so the notional uh, idea of content uh, addressable memories, uh, one of the pioneers being in this audience here, uh, doing that, that kind of stuff. The other thing to notice is that this variability and uh, multi-scale interactions is the norm. It's, like it's not uh, something you try to shy away from. These are things that exist, and our factual evidence is for that. For example, Christoph talked about a numerous number of cells, cell types, gene, gene, uh, genetic expressions for these cell types, and so on, is the norm. Uh, there's a whole bunch of, you know, we just talked about axodendritic synaptic interaction. There's a whole bunch of other, uh, you know, synaptic uh, means by which communication happens. Uh, axosecretory, axoaxonic, axodendritic, extra extracellular, and some of which are and dendrodendritic, and a whole bunch of others. And so. This seems to be a norm as well. There's a whole bunch of this. And it seems like plasticity itself, there is a state dependence as well as time scales uh, for these plasticity mechanisms. So what I mean by state dependence is that uh, it depends on the, some, some cases on the pre and the postsynaptic state of the neuron, of the spikes that get through the neuron, uh, or maybe just the postsynaptic uh, neuronal states, or just the presynaptic uh, inputs such as transmitter, transmitter induced. As well as time scales, there's a whole span of different time scales. Uh, you know, uh, you know we, talk, we heard about uh, synaptic facilitation, depression, and so on, uh, fast compensatory kind of uh, plasticity, uh, all the way to you know, spike timing, and then homeostatic, which are in the orders of minutes to maybe even days. So, and many of this, you know, sort of you can further classify them as Hebbian or non Hebbian, depending on the causality and how that was established. Um, and last, last but not the least, um, it seems like. 
you know, the structure, even if you knew, knew the structure, the structural network, the dynamics seems to dictate the, the functional connectivity. So, the, so even though two neurons may be sort of uh, uh, physically not connected, uh, when it actually comes to, you know, uh, executing a particular behavior, it seems to be uh, functionally linked together through this, this uh, dense network of connectivity, uh, which uh, is sort of um, very intriguing uh, in, from the point of view of uh, how this computing really happens. Um, so if I put all this together, one conclusion we can draw is that nervous system is a complex system. I don't think there'll be much debate about that. Uh, it's a collection of many, why? Because it's a collection of many interacting units, billions of them. Um, the collective behavior is affected by both memory and feedback that can change with time. And the collective behavior can also adapt their history to improve performance. And they are open thermodynamic systems, meaning they're influenced by the environment uh, constantly. Now, in terms of uh, other, the traits of them, so the system is spontaneously active. We, uh, there is no you know, switch off mode or power off mode where nothing happens. It's, it's a system that is far from equilibrium. It's uh, spontaneously active. Uh, they, it exhibits emergent phenomena that can be surprising sometimes, not programmed in, so to speak, as to everything is uh, you know, sort of predictable and programmed in, uh, which is good and bad. Uh, these phenomena can emerge without any invisible hand or a central controller, which is also very interesting. And it seems to seamlessly move between order and disorder, which is sort of uh, extremely interesting. Um, and and the, 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 the big takeaway here is one of the things is that it exhibits uh, it's a consistently a rich set of macrostates, behaviors, but with very little dependence on its microstates or billions of parameters, specifically if we were to actually sit and tune our, our neuronal parameters to actually behave in a, in, a, in a reliable way, we would be out of luck. We would sort of not survive at all. So the question is, how does this, this self-organization, so to speak, happen in order to realize consistently a rich set of macrostates or behaviors uh, from, a, from a bewilderingly complex space of microstates? So, uh, so I, I have three slides. So, so at this point, this is where it, so Intel is scratching us its head about really what is its uh, role here and what we want to do in this space. And uh, so there are three slides I have here that talk about uh, some of the ideas and some of the, th the thought process at Intel. Uh, it's very new. The whole thing is, uh, you know, I just joined in January, like I said. Uh, my colleague, Mike Davis, is in the audience who's been at Intel for a little longer than me, uh, but both of us are sort of scoping it out at this point. Uh, so one of those is success would demand understanding the essential elements or principles of neuroscience. So I talked about some of the you know, things that exist, but the question in particular would be, how to build self-organizing dynamical systems that is scalable, meaning that you could put, uh, if you sort of want to add more neurons and synapses or whatever you want to do with it in terms of size, that it naturally scale, while exhibiting the capacity to learn from its interactions with its environment in a stable and robust fashion. Something that where you can sort of, be, it's a reliable system that can be provably, uh, you know, provably robust is, is uh, Obviously, a tall order, but it seems like there's something uh, that's of great interest to Intel. Now, as you know, we have innovated uh, over the years in terms of a process innovation. There's a whole bunch of technologies out there today that could be brought into sort of, uh, you know, sort of become part of this whole uh, exercise here. Some of it, for example, X point memory, it's a transistorless uh, you know, system that is somewhere between DRAMs and flash. Uh, gives you much more dense, dense memories and non-volatility, but uh, uh, which is sort of new, and so products are expected to come out very soon on that. Uh, the whole slew of technologies, 3D integration side, uh, I can't say much too much about it, but there are some ideas there that are very, very interesting and relevant maybe. Uh, this idea of optical interconnects, um, where you have you know, 1.6 te uh, terabits per second interconnect speeds that are possible today with real technology uh, that exists. It's not some of this pie in the sky thing, it actually exists. There's a whole bunch of others from the device technology side as well that Intel has put its uh, focus into, uh, not, not really for neuromorphic in particular, but it seems like it could be relevant uh, going forward for what we want to do in this space. Now, the question to ask is how to leverage our state-of-the-art process technologies and other core technical competencies to build this, such a self-organizing system. What is the, what is the uh, 
what is the core set of uh, ideas or, or, or things that would make sense for a new, from the neuromorphic perspective. And then last but not the least, this idea demands uh, uh, searching a solution space. It's all about making money in the end for Intel. And uh, it has to be a value proposition that makes sense. From the, when I say value proposition in terms of scale, performance, power, cost, uh, just a notional sense of going from processes and devices all the way to applications uh, with a range of programmability and all the way back to benchmarking and refinement of these various uh, elements in the vertical stack to make sure that we have a, you know, to answer this question, which is what is the ecosystem, hardware and software resources that is necessary to create a strong value proposition from such a system? So uh, this is where we are today, uh, very early days for Intel in this space, but uh, very excited to be here and uh, you know, looking forward to uh, maybe potential collaborations with some of you to, to see where we can take this. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll stop and take some questions. mentioned a number of forms of plasticity and you know of course neurogenesis is something I like and other you know Paul's talked about you know the dendritic growth and so forth. But from a hardware perspective, what you know have you had any thoughts about how these sort of structural plasticity implementations can emerge at a more <coughs> chip level? Right. I mean so I mean there's uh, for now, I don't see in the foreseeable future anything that uh, things like wires growing out of these chips. No chance. But uh, having said that, uh, you know, you know, the obvious, some of the obvious ones would be if you had density, then you would have redundant resources on the chip to sort of use it that way, if possible, to program it or connect it up together or wire it up together to do some things that are interesting. Neurogenesis, for example, or sources like that. But certainly, early days for us, you know, we're not really, you know, we're sort of scoping the, the landscape of uh, what we need to do here. Uh, some of these things are obvious, seems from all the talks and uh, from the neuroscientist perspective, seems like we don't want to sweep these under the rug because they seem to be there and it's always the question as to what is it doing and the same old things come up over and over again. So the question is, are we there yet to sort of start thinking about uh, pushing the envelope to do something that is revolutionary and not evolutionary? And so Intel wants to put money into such a technology if it means it's going to be a revolutionary value proposition. So. I'd like you to talk a little bit more about one of the statements you made, that the brain uh, exhibits a wide variety of macro states uh -huh. without much sensitivity to micro states. Yeah. Now, I could take issue with you there, because if you've ever had a toothache, <laughs> that little nerve can <laughs> occupy your whole life right, and, right. and control how your thought process is yeah. unfolding. So, so what I mean by that is, you know, if you just take a neuron, right, and you take, uh, it has dendrites, it has all these, uh, you know, Phenomenologically, at least, there's all this range of parameters, time constants, a whole plethora of constants and, and thresholds and so on. And if you may have billions of those, you're talking of a huge number of variables that we have to potentially figure out how to, you know, sort of set up in order to have a hardware that works reasonably. If that is what we have to do, then it's really not, Intel is not interested clearly because that's something that's going to be uh, ridiculous in terms of complexity. Uh, but, uh, so, so that's what I meant by saying microstates in the sense that all the state variables that are dependent on time and voltage and that change and that have all these constants that you have to deal with and set in order to make the system behave in a certain way at the global scale is what I'm talking about. Okay. Um, I think, though, such a system has to accommodate the fact that a very small perturbation uh -huh. can actually influence the whole system. In fact, that might be the way nature set it up. Right, right. So, so the sensitivity, uh, it depends on the modes in, in which it operates. I mean, if it's uh, uh, at, 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 the, you know, at, the, at the edge of chaos, as, as Wolfgang would call it uh, from before, you know, that is more sensitive to smallest to small perturbations. Whereas if it's subcritical or this, uh, modes where it's very stable, maybe it may not, may not be, it may be able to tolerate it. So it has all these modes. It's not necessarily one or the other. And so the question is, how does it even, you know, do that. I mean, so that's the, that's the, that's our question. I mean, yeah. Automatically, self-organized. Thank you again. Thanks a lot.